Good afternoon, Buju, and welcome. My name is Jordan Martinson. I'm Lakudre Ojibwe from Northern Wisconsin and currently work out of the Tribal Law and Policy Institute's West Hollywood, California office. Welcome to the second session of the 2021 Enhancement Training Veterans Track. Today, we are fortunate to have an opportunity to dialogue with two amazing talents, uh, Lawrence Hott and Patty Lowe. Lawrence Hott is a member of the Florentine Films Consortium. Mr. Hott helped found Florentine Films and Hot Productions in 1981. And Mr. Hott's productions, um, he's produced over two dozen films uh, for national PBS broadcast, as well as several productions for web and educational distribution. Uh, Mr. Hott's work include an Emmy, two Academy Award nominations, and a Columbia Journalism Award, just to name a few. Patty Lowe is a professor at Medill and director of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research at Northwestern. A member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe, Lowe is a former broadcast, journal, a former broadcast journalist in public and commercial television. Patty has also produced many documentaries for public and commercial television, including the award-winning Way of the Warrior, which was the original installment and the genesis of the documentary, which we will be viewing today, The Warrior Tradition. So in order to allow enough time uh, to view this uh, awesome documentary and allow for some questions and Q&A uh, following airing of this documentary, we'll get going. A lot of people ask, why did you join the white man's war? They weren't nice to you. That may be so. Still, this is our land. This is our home. This has always been our home. And part of the commitment to protecting and defending your home led to military service. We have the highest per capita service rate out of any group in America because of the fact that our Native people have always wanted to fulfill that warrior path. As a Native American woman and also growing up in a military family, it was just natural for me to want to join the military. I always saw myself as a warrior. I was told I was. I was told I was strong, I can do anything, and I believed it, still do. As I left for the military, um, I was given these feathers right here. These two were carried by my great-great-great-grandfather on his rifle when he was an Apache scout. Those feathers carried with me my ancestors. They had been to World War I, they'd been to World War II, they'd been to Korea, Vietnam. And as I was carrying that, I felt like I had my family with me to protect me. Being a warrior is not necessarily about going out and killing people. It's about keeping the peace as well and making sure that our traditions and culture are staying in line with our values, protecting our land, our family, our community. And that's part of the warrior tradition. wanted to be a soldier. I didn't want to be anything else. I wanted to be a soldier. When I was young, I grew up in my grandparents' home. And in my grandparents' home, there was a photograph of my great uncle. He was killed in action on 10 April 1945 in Germany. I always saw this photo in my grandparents' home. 
around 1954, my uncle's photo, who served in the Army, was placed next to him. In 1955, my aunt's photograph, an Air Force veteran, was placed next to him. So from about age six, seven, and as I progressed as a teenager, I saw these three photos of these three veterans. My aunt, my uncle, and my great uncle. And that was an inspiration for me to enlist in the military, plus my Taiwan and Comanche heritage. I wanted to be a warrior. I grew up in a very strong military family. My great-great-grandfather was a, an Apache scout. My great-grandfather served in World War I. Then I had my uncles serve in uh, World War II and Korea, and then my uncle in Vietnam, and then my mom served as well. Growing up around my family members, I would start asking questions, uh, what it meant to be a warrior. If you're a veteran amongst the Comanches or the Kiowas, you're kind of like special. You're respected because of what you did in the military. And if you go to war and you're in combat, you're kind of set on a pedestal. We have the Comanche Indian Veterans Association Court of Honor. The highlight of that memorial is a life-size statue dedicated to our Comanche code talkers of World War II. It's called a spirit talker. The Comanche Court of Honor that has about 1,200 names of our Comanches that have served in the military. Their relatives, their friends, when they come to the complex, it's always a point that they go to our memorial and they point their finger and said, hey, this was my grandfather. I didn't know he did this. I didn't know he did that. I remember going to powwows growing up and and seeing the opening ceremony and the veterans coming in. I always wanted to be a part of that. Uh, George, take about, uh, come up to here. Come up to here. That's good. All right, we're missing somebody right here. Uh, right side, of, uh, in between George and Rhonda, you two switch. Roger over here. By them, okay. We celebrate Veterans Day, and during this powwow, we recognize and honor our veterans for the military service. The powwow is just a time when people come together to celebrate. They're honoring the tradition. They're honoring that we are still here. They will fly a U.S. flag, they'll carry in the U.S. colors, and they will recognize their veterans and honor them. because they still feel that sense of gratitude that they're able to go and defend the United States as well as defend their communities and preserve our Native American heritage. They will also honor active duty soldiers that are getting ready to deploy. It made me feel good to see these young people preparing and training up for deployment to a not too good place, you know, Iraq, and especially Syria. Give them a round of applause for that beautiful grand entry here at the 42nd 
Comanche Indian Veterans Association Veterans Day celebration. We sort of adopted this battalion of engineers. We gave them the title of Task Force Comanche. And that's a pretty high honor. They're gonna carry our Comanche flag into a war zone and represent not only their battalion, but the Comanche nation. What do we got? Oh. They had never seen anything like this in their life. It was an opportunity, and we welcomed the opportunity for them to join in with our traditional ways, our dances. Here you have an army unit that is deploying into harm's way, and they felt like they had a connection that they wanted to draw from the Comanche spirit and to be recognized as Task Force Comanche. Before I deployed to Korea, they had a powwow for me, an honor dance in my hometown. And uh, we danced, we sang, they recognized me. It made me feel so proud that our Comanche people gathered. And then I went off feeling good. People have asked me with the history of the Comanche and the Kiowa, the government taking your land, why did you go into the military? Well, you know, we lost our land once. We're not gonna lose it a second time. It's still our land. The white man has killed his game, driven his tribe from their hunting ground and broken every treaty. From just about the beginning of the United States itself, the government has fought various wars against native nations. And that's the irony. Here's a government that has at various times tried to exterminate or assimilate Native Americans, destroy their culture, take their land, and yet here are Native Americans serving in the highest percentages of any race or ethnicity relative to their numbers in the U.S. military. There was one vet that I spoke to and I asked him why he enlisted. And he said that his people had signed a peace and friendship treaty with the US government, promising to protect the nation should it ever need its services. And he said, even though the United States has broken every treaty it ever negotiated, I'm still obligating my end of the treaty. Native Americans have fought in every war that the United States has been part of. I have a relative who appears as an Indian scout on the roles of General Montcalm who fought during the French and Indian War. There's a tradition, and in literally every Indian family, of fighting for the United States. The Civil War, the uh, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, even nowadays in, in Afghanistan and Iraq. They have fought against the United States, they have fought for the United States, and they have fought against each other. People around the world, when they think about a warrior, they really have an image of the Plains Indian riding on a horse, going into battle, perhaps carrying a shield, but certainly the bows and arrows. I think that's really kind of fixed in people's minds around the world. I think Native people look at those images and we're kind of like, that's not really us. You know, that's not really us. We drive white men from prairie. People had a stereotype of what a native looks like. Some of the other stereotypes that they had is that we could find our way anywhere in the woods without a map, that we were expert at tracking and, and, and navigating and finding the enemy. And some of us 
couldn't find ourselves out of a wet paper bag. When I was a tank commander, everyone knew I was an Indian. So I got to be the lead vehicle. Because I was Indian, I hope to know where I'm going. Well, I knew where I was going because I had a map and a compass. Some of them thought we were like Geronimo. We could shoot from miles away and get that target. They tried to put us in a box, and they tried to say, you know, this is how you guys should be. This is how you should do it. It's a stereotype. Americans have always seen Native Americans as just this group identity. Uh, they don't recognize the fact that there were thousands of different Native American nations uh, before colonization, and there are 573 recognized tribes today. And they're very different. They have different religions, different economies, different political structures. Different tribal traditions, different histories, they have different languages. And so the motivations for why a Native American man or woman would enlist in the military are also diverse. From this primitive home, a Navajo chief has sent three sons to the Army. They're proud of their honor roll. 700 Indian boys from one small county are serving with America's armed forces. American Indians loyal to their country. I've been asked the question numerous times, how can you belong to an army that was once responsible for committing genocide against your people. This is our land. The four sacred mountains, that's our land. These are our mountains. The rivers within the four sacred mountains, that's our river. We want to protect it. We want to preserve it for our family for our relatives, for our children, for the future generation. The warrior culture in the late 1800s for all Native Americans was disappearing as the reservation system really made it unnecessary. There were no more enemies to fight. You couldn't fight the United States because you were powerless against their might. We were warriors. After we came onto the reservations, we were no longer warriors. We weren't allowed to carry our weapons. We weren't allowed to, to do anything except what the government, the government uh, allowed. And as the older generation that had known freedom begins to die off, you'd think that pretty much that's going to be the end of it. But with World War I, we find that Native Americans enlisted in a tremendously large percentage, higher than anyone else. My grandfather actually enlisted before World War I and enlisted in the Wisconsin National Guard. Why he would willingly risk his life to protect the American Constitution was something that I didn't really understand. What I've come to know since is that he was primed for military service by his time in an Indian boarding school where the environment was very militarized. He drilled in a little cadet uniform with a wooden rifle every morning at five o'clock. He marched to his dormitory, he marched to the mess hall, he marched to his classes. And when World War I broke out, men like my grandfather were primed to enter and enlist in World War I. The strange thing about World War I is that during this period, uh, a lot of Native Americans weren't US citizens yet. It was the military service of the 12 to 15,000 Native American men, like my grandfather, who served in World War I, that inspired the US government to confer citizenship on these veterans. But for the United States, it's, it's again, it's a tremendous example of how assimilation has worked and how Native Americans are proud patriots. I think World War II really was the thing that kind of changed the perception of Native peoples in Americans' eyes because we were war heroes. On Capitol Hill this morning, members of 33 Native American tribes received congressional gold medals for their work as code talkers during World War I and World War II. Code talkers used their native languages to send messages that the enemy could not decipher. My name is 
Peter McDonald and I'm from Tisnaus Pass, Arizona, that's near Four Corners. I served in the United States Marines during World War II as a member of the Navajo Code Talkers. The first group that went in in 1942, 29 of young Navajos were recruited. It was a top secret project. The enemy in the Pacific was breaking every military code that was being used by the Army, Navy, Marines, and Air Force. There was no way to communicate without the enemy knowing what you're going to do or where you're going to be, what day, what hour, and the location. And they would be there with their submarine or their airplane, blow you up. Very bad. So they were looking for a code, and they sought Navajo language. I went to a boarding school. When you enter the boarding school, the first thing they tell you, don't ever talk Navajo. If you catch you talking Navajo, they punish you. They grab you by your hair and they stick that soap down in your mouth and wash that dirty word you just said. Spit it out or vomit. Now, wait a minute. Here they told us that we're no good and forget your language because your language is tradition. Tradition is an enemy to progress and all that. Now, somehow they discovered that maybe Navajo language will be something that would save the war in the Pacific. And it did. The first group that went in developed 260 code words. Like code word for hand grenade, for instance, was numasi. Numasi in Navajo means potato. Why? Because hand grenade looks like a potato. So if another Navajo outside this top secret classroom hear us say numasi, they think we're talking about French fries. They were told, everything you do in this top secret classroom must be subject to memory only. You cannot take any notes with you into battle. August 7, 1942, 1st Marine Division landed on the island of Guadalcanal. with 13 of the Navajo code talkers to test the code that was just developed. After Guadalcanal, Bougainville. After Bougainville, Cape Cluster, New Britain, Tarawa, Macon, Kowajalan, Inuitok, Saipan, Tinian, Guam, Palalu, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, every landing in the Pacific, Navajo code was used. It actually became an official United States military code to be treated and protected the same way all other military codes that were in use at that time. General Vandergriff sent word back to the United States saying, this Navajo code is terrific. The enemy never understood it, he said. We don't understand it either, but it works. Send us some more Navajos. The U.S. did everything it could to erase Indian languages, and then it turns out that the Navajo language made a huge difference in the success in the Pacific during World War II. And ever since then, the U.S. has been trying to recruit Native Americans. There's a very famous photograph from World War II of a Menominee naval person in a, a full war bonnet, which is wrong on so many levels since the, you know, the Menominee, our woodland tribe, didn't wear those kinds of plains headdresses. He's on one knee, he's got the rifle back, he's posed, and this was a very 
famous photograph that was used in a lot of recruitment uh, materials. And the military has been doing it ever since. Military recruiters have always found is a uh, an ear that was open uh, to joining the military because it fits so congruently with our, our warrior culture and that warrior spirit in action. Bandit 3, this is Fox 2-3. Can you get that contact to our front? Bandit Fox 2-3, out. The military spends millions of dollars on nice, glossy TV commercials. There are those who choose a different path in life. Brochures, pamphlets, to bring in recruits. If you go into recruiting offices in border towns near Indian reservations, you'll see warrior images, native warrior images in those materials. The U.S. military understands that there's this warrior tradition in Indian country, and it's not afraid to use it. They fight for country. They fight for honor. They fight to win. Do you have what it takes? Find out at GoArmy.com slash warriors. Recruiters take advantage of the warrior tradition very effectively. They can play off that really well. They're trained to do this. They'll talk about how the strong, powerful tradition you have as warriors, don't you want to keep that going? You should sign up for the army or whatever branch they're from. You don't really have to sell the military because they already want to be a part of it. You know, there's such a strong lineage of Native Americans. My mom was a recruiter, and we were sitting at the dinner table one night, and I said, Mom, I want to join the Army. And she kind of laughed. I was like, no, I'm serious, Mom. I want to join. She sat me down and said, you want to join? Let's get you a job you like. She said, you love art. You love photography. Let's look and see what we can get you. So she said, I found a good, safe job for you. So I enlisted in as a combat cameraman. She didn't catch the word combat in there. She was just happy I had a job, cameraman, in the Army. She thought I was going to be in a photo lab nice and safe. For me, joining the military was about trying to turn a, a, a new leaf, trying to restart my life, because I had been such a screw-up uh, as a young man. I had uh, had legal troubles. I'd gotten uh, arrested a few times. Uh, I was going nowhere. I was at a dead-end job. So for me, it was a way to restart my life and to do it in a way that was meaningful. Joining the Marine Corps and coming out of the Marine Corps, I was a different guy. I was a different guy. I was ready to go back to school. I was ready to, to start a new chapter. For other Native Americans, it's often the same thing. Uh, they they want to start a new chapter in their life. They want to reclaim that identity as a Native warrior. They want to reclaim their identity as Native Americans. A lot of my uncles, cousins, relatives joined the service, uh, not only in wartime, but in peacetime, because it was, it was an economic pursuit. It was a way to get away from the reservation and to make money. Uh, and, and to be able to provide for your family. And so, again, you know, that's kind of the warrior tradition to provide, provide, to, to help out, to make sure your community's in, in good shape. We joined the military out of pride and not financial necessity. Uh, sometimes it may give a, a resource out of poverty, but it's not a complete solution in itself. And a lot of times, what we sacrifice to be in the military far outweighs any monetary benefit we may receive. It is a way of earning respect to fight for the United States. It's also being recognized as a warrior, and in this way, not just by the United States government, but also among your own community. And sometimes the latter is more important than fighting for the United States government. I think mainstream America can learn a lot from Indian service beginning with the way Native communities prepare their soldiers for service, understanding that there's a spiritual component to war. And a lot of people don't think about that. But if you are going into a situation where you may lose your life or take the life of someone else, there's nothing more spiritual than that. When I was young, we lived out in the country. It was just my grandpa and my grandma and I. I was uh, 
raised by my grandparents. One day, my grandfather came over and said, Takoje yota ka which means, grandson, sit down, I want to talk to you. So I, I didn't want to because I wanted to go play, but um, I uh, sat with him. And after a while, it seemed like I can hear the birds singing out there. I can hear a lot of other sounds. And about an hour later, after four times offering me the pipe, uh, he said, Grandson, we're done talking. And he never once said one word. I was able to learn patience through that. And so when I was in Vietnam, I thought it kind of saved my life a few times because we had to sit there and ambush for a long, long time without moving. You don't speak. You're out in the forest and you listen to Mother Nature and you listen to everything that's happening around you, and you listen to yourself and your soul. Was well, I was up front, so it kind of helped me out quite a bit. He was getting me ready for things like that, combat and stuff I didn't know at that time. So that's how I learned silence is power. I was uh, the eyes and ears on the battlefield Something that didn't seem right or stood out was wrong. It would catch my eye, and then I would start photographing it, and the infantrymen would pick up on it. And then sometimes I would wonder in the back of my mind, was it just the photography, or was it part of my native culture and some of my traditions that was tuning me into the potential of something going wrong? One of my more well-known photographs uh, I shot during the battle in, in Samara uh, for ap uh, Operation uh, Baton Rouge. Uh, the, the engineers had just blown the wall out, and as the wall was coming down, I was third in the stack. Two guys went through, and then I went through, and I turned around. As I turned around, stuff was still falling, and uh, three guys were coming through the wall, and I was like, that's the shot. And it just got used over and over and over again. It got picked up by Newsweek, got picked up by uh, the Washington Post and, and other papers. Right before the Battle of Fallujah, which was in November 2004 in Iraq, um, I remember we were preparing for battle. So uh, I joke, I called my Humvee my war pony, my iron war pony. And uh, so I started blessing it, uh, started uh, marking it and smudging it. I uh, had my hawk feathers hanging up in there and my eagle feathers. And so I was prepping for battle spiritually and um, getting myself mentally ready for the battle. And that was a lot of our culture and traditions that we would do before a battle is prepare ourselves to face the enemy. During all of my overseas deployment, my grandmother, she would pray in the Kiowa language and she would place paint here, here, back of my head, here, and here, here. She called it her medicine. I can remember incidents in Vietnam where I could have been killed or seriously injured. Uh, but, for example, I was standing in one spot, I moved from that spot, and a minute later, a mortar round hit exactly where I was saying. Is that luck? Probably, but I think it was my grandmother's prayers. I had three feathers that I carried with me on my, on my person uh, the entire time. I had one eagle feather that I taped to my front plate on my vest, and then I had another one that I taped to my back plate and then the third feather, I had it tied on to, to the end of my weapon. I was in a lot of heavy firefights, and uh, that, I was, I was never touched. The yellow corn pollen blessed by a Navajo medicine man. Before we leave for overseas, the corn pollen is put into a longer buckskin bag with full of corn pollen. Medicine man blesses it, 
saying, when you get into a real tough situation in war, take this and say your prayers for protection. They tie this to their dog tag. So you get into a real tough situation, maybe bullets flying five to 10 inches over their heads, mortar shells exploding everywhere, looks like you're not gonna be there for another minute. They untie this from the dog tag, open it up, take a pinch of it, put it on your tongue. Take another pinch, put it on top of your head. Take another one, make an offering down in your foxhole. There's that guy with us in the foxhole. He would say, hey, chief, what are you doing? Asking for help and protection. He would say, may I have some? War is such a terribly traumatic experience. And there are times when nothing can protect a warrior from the horrors of war. You've agreed to allow yourself go from a person of peace to a person, uh, to an instrument of war. And the toll that that takes on, is incredible on the, on the human psyche. I wasn't the same person I was before I went to Vietnam than I was when I came back. Uh, I'll never forget the images of the 18 Viet Cong that we killed. I mean, body parts, arms, legs, half of their body. It itches in your mind, and you think about it. Uh, sometimes you have bad dreams, you, you have these flashbacks. I wish that I could sleep one night for eight straight hours, and I have it in 50-something years, you know. Yeah, I think, I think I up there. Got it. There's a lot of folks over there that are no longer on this earth because of what I had to do. So that's hard to live with sometimes. Um, the ones that I actually, the ones that I actually shot and seen fall, I see them all the time. Even the toughest guy out there, the strongest dude out there, you know, he tells you it doesn't bother him. He's full of it. I had PTSD. There was times where I felt concerned about how I was dealing with it, and. I, it's really important to recognize and be that warrior, um, to reach out, to say you need help. And largely it was my, my tribe that helped me. They wanna make sure when you come back, you have somewhere to come back to. And to me, that's part of being a warrior. And luckily we have ceremonies traditionally that are set up just for that reason. It's to bring those people back in, to balance, back into harmony, back into connection with their home community so they don't feel displaced and they don't just continue to walk around with those wounds that are internal, that are spiritual, that never get resolved or remedied. You can't just simply welcome a returning soldier back. There's a period of intense reintegration where you have to reintroduce a soldier to his or her humanity and that if you don't do that, you're putting the entire society at risk. That's something that mainstream society can learn from Indian country. When I came home in 2005, in February, I have a home powwow, the Copan powwow, which is the Delaware tribe. And they had an honor ceremony for me. And at that time, I was presented with my honor blanket and my Pawnee clothes. I wasn't the only one who had something like that. Just about every Native American Comanche Kiowa that I knew that served in Vietnam, their families did the same for them. It, just, it was just a 
tradition that goes back to, uh, to the Plains days, you know, honor the warriors. Some tribes honor before you go. They, they do a dance for you before you go. And other tribes will honor you when you come back. A lot of tribes have, they're not so much welcoming home ceremonies as they are purification ceremonies. We go to powwows as veterans, as a group. We're around each other, you know, and we talk to each other. You know, I've never told any of my fellow veterans what I just told you about the dead bodies. And, uh, but we know what we went through. March 23rd, 2003, Lori Piastawa was in the 507th Maintenance Company. There were people missing in action, people that were unaccounted for, um, and Lori was one of them. Earlier today, an Army maintenance unit was moving through south-central Iraq. Somehow, they strayed from their position and encountered Iraqi military forces. A firefight ensued. We can tell you that some U.S. soldiers were killed, some indeed captured, now being held by the Iraqis. Specialist Lori Piestawa, a member of the Hopi tribe and the 507th Maintenance Company, was taken prisoner along with her battle buddy, PFC Jessica Lynch. Lori died shortly thereafter in an Iraqi hospital. It was really hard to lose that daughter. You never expect your children are going to go before you. Lori is the first Native American woman to die in all the wars that the United States has been in. She's the first one to die in foreign soil. The town is Tuba City, where Lori's image can be found everywhere. On the front page of the newspaper, a picture of Lori and her roommate, Jessica Lynch, whose rescue only a few days ago raised so much hope for the others, including Lori. But it was not to be. We feel that her purpose in life was to bring peace and unity to everybody and She's brought so many people together. Her legacy is to instill that in people that we need to be peaceful, we need to work together. Her home state of Arizona renamed Squaw Peak in the Phoenix Mountains as Piestawa Peak. And every year, the Lori Piestawa National Native American Games is held, which brings participants from across the country. In our culture, it is not common for women to be warriors. It is not common for women to go out and fight. But Lori did. Women can serve in limited combat roles, although that's really debatable. If you're driving a truck full of armaments and you're in a convoy, as Lori Paestawa was, for example, you are seeing very active combat and, and perhaps even paying the ultimate price, as she did. If you look at every photograph I see of Lori, she's smiling. She's always smiling. Lori loved life. She also, I think, was willing to give up her life to have somebody else be able to live and have the freedoms that we have. In Indian country, Lori Paestawa is held up as a symbol of the, the kind of bravery and sacrifice that Native Americans have made um, and contributed to the U.S. military since there was a United States. Being a woman, not just a Native American woman, but a woman in a military, it's been difficult. I felt like I've had to do twice as much work to prove myself as an equal. But I think it will be a long time before some of the tribes accept women as veterans. I know that there are some of the warrior societies that still to this day won't accept women into their groups. Um, they may offer them a separate group, but they won't allow them to stand side by side with the male, even though we are able to do the same jobs. It is about defending what we love. It is about being humble. It is about being respectful of all life. And then also it is about courage. And courage is not muscle. 
in strength. It is about standing up for what is right. And that is um, the warrior way. Well, there's more than one way to be a warrior. You can be a diplomat warrior. You can help people build infrastructure to bring roads and bridges and into their communities. I had built a rapport with the Afghan security forces and the commander for that unit wanted to ask some questions about me. And so he said, ask her, where is she from? And I said, I'm Native American. And he got quiet. And then he just broke out in this excitement and says, she's Red Man. And, you know, around the room, you know, you're hearing, she's Red Man, she's Red Man, she's Red Man. And he says, what tribe are you? And I said, well, I'm Comanche. And his response was, Comanche. You know, like there was this reverence, this deep respect they had. And then I said, um, and then I'm also Apache. And no sooner than I said that I was Apache, they yelled out, Geronimo! <laughs> and, <laughs> and it literally brought tears to my eyes, and it still does, because I said, you know about Geronimo? So then the colonel calms them down, and then in that quiet stillness of a moment, he says something very powerful. And he says, we thought they wiped you out. And I said, no, we are still here. In 2004, I was deployed to Iraq with the 120th Combat Heavy Engineers. Four other uh, females was in the tent with me. And out of all the four of us, we were all Choctaw. The chaplain was looking at her tribal site in the United States and saw a powwow happening and called me in. And I just happened to ask her, could you think we could put on a powwow here? I didn't think nothing of it. I mean, we're in a combat zone. And that's how it started. It wasn't a powwow like in the States, where everybody was dressed in their regalia and everything was made from things back home. But things here in Iraq, the drum was made out of a 55-gallon oil drum cut in half. Their stick balls that we were using, they were old broom handles that were cut. And we used parachute cords to make the netting. I wouldn't have thought ever that they were going to allow me to do that. So, you know, think big or go home. So the powwow was a big event. We introduced uh, the idea of a Native American uh, event slowly by playing games. Uh, they can take their weapons, set them down for a few minutes, play tomahawk throws blow darts or Indian marbles, Indian stickball. While we were playing stickball, a lot of the non-natives probably thought we were crazy. We came under mortar attack. But instead of running for cover, we just kept playing stickball. It, it, you know, stickball's a serious game. You can't, you can't leave it. I believe that having a powwow in a combat zone sends the message not only to Native Americans and non-Native Americans, but to the soldiers and non-soldiers alike that hear about the powwow, that the Native Americans are still very much alive. They're still very much a part of the world. The combat cameraman in me wanted to document it because I've never heard of a powwow in a combat zone. And sure enough, it's the first one that was ever documented and the first one that's ever known to be a full-blown powwow 
in a combat zone. We all can learn from each other regardless of what size, what shape, what ideal, what thought, what tribe, Indian, non-Indian, what we are, that we can communicate, we can help each other, we can learn. We want them to know us, we want to know them. And having that powwow help them understand. What made the powwow even more unique here was a, a government that tried to exterminate us, tried to do away with us, and now they were allowing us to embrace our culture and have this huge celebration in Iraq and celebrating our warrior traditions and just our basic traditions. And that made it phenomenal. That made it unique. I think the definition of warrior is changing in Indian country. I think we appreciate the service of, of anyone in the US military, whether they're native or not. But at the same time, there's this questioning now that I see on the part of, of younger um, native people asking, well, you know, do we have to define warrior as combat or participation in the US military? Can we think about warrior traditions differently? Can we say that someone who is willing to put their life on the line at an environmental protest, are they warriors? A lot of Native people would say they are. On the high plains of North Dakota, a conflict is unfolding. This is Standing Rock, where thousands of Native Americans have gathered to protest against a planned oil pipeline that will run under the nearby Missouri River. In 2017, with the emerging of the pipeline protest in North Dakota, Indian people and environmentalists became known as water protectors. And so we have that kind of contradiction in that Indians who had fought uh, for the United States are now fighting against the United States government. At the same time, then veterans come to support Native people, and many of them are American Indian veterans. And the encampment at Standing Rock grows from a few thousand to maybe as 10 to 12,000. That would be the largest gathering for an Indian cause in history. When I got out of the military, when I retired, Nobody told me that I had to stop protecting. And I felt like there's more that we can do in uh, talking with a lot of other Native Americans and non-Native Americans, just all veterans, that actually made the trip for Veterans for Standing Rock. They all felt the same way, that these were the people we were supposed to protect. And a lot of our military members, when they go back home, they get involved in activism, because they are using their skill sets to protect and defend their people. So I, I think that's why we had so many veterans that were at Standing Rock. Being at Standing Rock is consistent with the warrior tradition. We're supposed to protect those that can't protect themselves. We're supposed to stand in the gap and face danger. It was really kind of showing that, hey, we had fought for the United States military. We had fought for this country and now we're doing the right thing, why don't you do the right thing too and stop the pipeline because it's harming the environment, it's dishonoring uh, the legal rights of the Standing Rock Sioux people and things need to be corrected. The water protectors at Standing Rock ultimately lost, the pipeline did get built, but they managed to ignite a solidarity movement that many of us haven't seen in a long, long time. And that really is the warrior tradition. At a powwow, when I see babies, there's just a sense of hope a hope for the next generation that's gonna come along and they're gonna embrace our culture. 
They're going to learn these songs. You know, that's a new dancer coming in. That's a new singer coming in. And also the potential that that's a new veteran. That's a new warrior that's going to learn the warrior ways. Right now, my nephew is in the Air Force. He's serving in Okinawa, Japan. When he comes home on leave again, I'm going to pass these two feathers on to him so that he can carry the tradition on. And then hopefully one day he will pass them on to someone else in our family to continue our traditions as warriors and the traditions of the feathers being passed from one warrior to another warrior. I'll never forget that feeling the first time you hear the drum. Because even though we had come home and gotten off the plane and had started to resettle with our families, and you know, you, you know you're alive. But it's not until you hear the drum and they're putting in your hand a staff, an eagle feather, the American flag, that you actually feel alive. You feel alive, your heart is beating with the beat of that drum and reminding you that you made it back, that you're here, that you're alive and you have a purpose. Amazing, amazing documentary. And uh, we'll get going right away. Uh, we're a little short on time, but we do have about 15 to 20 minutes left. And we're lucky enough to have uh, both Patty Lowe and Lawrence Hott, um, the filmmakers behind this series, available uh, for any questions that you all may have in the audience. Uh, we can work to unmute you or feel free to drop questions in the chat. Um, I do have some questions that came to my mind as we were going through this. Um, so we'll just get going in one moment and we'll um, see if we have Lawrence on as well. Okay, so I'll just get going with the questions right away, Professor Lowe, if you don't mind. That's fine. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so Initially, um, I'm wondering if you could just explain to the audience maybe how you became interested um, in both your family's history um, in military participation and uh, Native American particip participation in the military as well. There's Larry. Um, Welcome, Larry. Uh, well, I my grandfather was one of 12,000 Native Americans who volunteered for World War I. And I always imagined him standing there, you know, taking that oath to protect and defend the US Constitution. And he was not a citizen, so he had no protections under the American Constitution. And I, I thought that was um, interesting. Um, my father, my uncles, all the men in my family served in the military throughout wars of the 20th century. So that was something. And um, I think about 20 years before I produced the documentary you, you referenced um, earlier, uh, I, I was traveling around the country and collecting stories from Native American veterans, men and women, um, because I was trying to answer that question that I think Larry answered with his documentary was, you know, which was, why would you serve in, a, in the military for a country that has treated your people so shabbily? And the answers were diverse because Native America is diverse. Um, but when you stripped away all the, all the answers, it seemed like the common denominator was that 
Native people are defending their land and their people, not so much defending the American flag or the American government, it's defending their land. And that seemed to be kind of a universal sentiment. Thank you for that. I mean, I guess I'd pose the same question uh, for Mr. Hot as well. Um, I was just wondering, like, how did this topic and subject of uh, Native American military participation and that tradition um, come to your interest? And how did you come to, to make this film? Well, I've done a lot of historical documentaries, and it's very hard to avoid the Native American experience. Uh, I did a major film on the War of 1812, where Native Americans were every aspect of it. That's one of the reasons for the war in the, in the, right. in the first place. Um, I, more recently, I did a film on the Lakota, the revitalization of the Lakota language, um, which ties right into the boarding schools and all those aspects and the way that people have been suppressed and the importance of language. And then even before that, I did a a series uh, called The Wilderness Idea about the concept of wilderness. And is there even a concept of wilderness in the United States that it seems to imply that there's no people in a wilderness, but Native Americans were there. So it seems that I, kept, I, I could not avoid this topic. Um, PBS came to me and asked me if I would work on this and they had a very short time schedule. And I, I actually did say to them, why me? You know, there's a lot of good solid Native American filmmakers, but they said, you have the track record of doing this. And they immediately matched me up with Patty uh, and said, okay, here's somebody who's done a similar film, who is very knowledgeable. And in fact, as you saw, Patty become, becomes the key voice in the film. So I thought that having that collaboration and all the other Native American scholars that we worked with in the film, um, plus I know you don't, it's not, we don't say it in the film, but more than half of the music is uh, either composed by or performed by Native Americans. So we thought this was a way to really uh, make it their story. Um, but it does beg another question, which is how do you make a story out of this? And Patty alluded to this when you have 573 recognized tribes, but far more than that. And how do you make it coherent? Um, and that really, that was the challenge. And I'd be happy to talk about that more if you wanna go, go into that. Yeah, I, I would love to hear that actually. So it basically, when you have what is a survey film, as opposed to a biography or an incident or a court case, something that has a beginning and middle and end, you've got to find those beginning, middles and ends in short bursts and tie them together in some way. Uh, so for example, the, the Code Talkers, which is a famous story, but how do you do it in a way that makes it, makes it fresh and is a complete story? Or the... Uh, the water protector story that comes at the very end. Uh, how do you make that into a story so that it has a, a, an, an ending to it? So that it maybe it's more chapters in, in a book. And that, this is key, key for, for filmmaking. But I think the biggest issue for me, uh, and this was after my first question, my first discussion with Patty was, who are the interviewees gonna be? When you have literally a couple of million people who could talk about it, how do you get down to it? And I'll just tell you that short story is after looking at all the books and looking at the pictures in the books and, and trying to find people who wrote the stories about it, I still wasn't getting to people I thought were gonna tell the stories well. And somebody suggested a Vietnam vet to me, I, I uh, couldn't get a hold of him, but somebody gave me his daughter's name. Stephanie Birdwell is her name. And she was, I didn't know this, but she turned out to be in the US Department of Veterans Affairs in the Office of Tribal Governments. She got so excited about this project that she said, give me a couple of days and I will put together a group of everybody around the entire country. And we're gonna have a conference call. And we're gonna to talk to you about who we think are the best people. And they came at me with 200 names. And I said, that's impossible. Let's boil it down by you know, what I'm looking for. We ended up with 70 people and I called and interviewed every single one of them. And then we boiled it down to 30 interviews. Um, and then you see, then you saw the people who made it into the, into the final film. So that gives you a sense of, of what, it, what it took to get people who could be charismatic, articulate, get across a, a story. And then the key point in filmmaking, 
is a story for which we could find B-roll, something that we could show, <laughs> because if you have nothing to show, then it's, a, it, then it's an essay and it's not a film. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I did have a question about how you did come to contact each of the individuals that were featured um, in the documentary. And that, that definitely answers my question. Um, I was curious because you did mention within the documentary itself, there are smaller stories or not smaller stories, but individual stories from different individuals throughout the country. Um, and I, one thing I noticed is um, we ended with the discussion of the controversy regarding the pipeline and notions of exactly what the warrior tradition is. Um, so I'm wondering, first, for, this is a question for both of you, I guess, but do you perceive after the work that you've done that the warrior tradition is more static or more malleable first? Um, and how is the notion of the warrior tradition being um, redefined, I guess, in current times? Patty, why don't you go first, because I just spoke for a while. All right. Um, I hear those conversations about who is a warrior. And I think the younger generations are asking, can you be a warrior if you defend the language? If you uh, go into medicine and you know, certainly the people that have been um, fighting COVID are, are warriors. Uh, I see the conversation um, widening a bit. And, you know, I think culture is always fluid. So I, th I think it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, I think this is a national conversation that the Native American experience feeds into uh, a tiny percentage of the United States population serves in the military. But we are talking a lot about what is national service. You know, we had the, we still have the Peace Corps, we had VISTA, uh, we have the Teaching Corps. Um, and so there is, a, in a sense, you know, Vietnam really screwed things up for us because uh, it made it difficult for a whole generation to, to uh, be associated with that war. And you, saw, you, you see this still, it came out in the interviews. Uh, that's not, it didn't make it, uh, it came out in the interviews, but it was not um, in the film. But there was still, you know, 50 years later, this anger at the way they were treated when they, when they came home. And so this question of what is service is important. And it's hard to separate out the, the actual military, the, the danger of combat from the warrior tradition. But I, I just, this, this is the, when I told people I was doing this film, non-natives non had a knee-jerk reaction. They say, oh, of course Native Americans want to serve in the military because they're economically depressed and this is, a, this is an easy job. And we tried to dispel that notion in, in the film. Mm -hmm. um, but the other aspect of it is the, 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 the family commitment to it. It still begs the question, which is why is that family commitment there and so strong? And, I, and we got at that somewhat in the film, but I think there's more there's definitely more to it. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I think I went off in another direction, but <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot more to it. No, that was, that was very illuminating, um, actually, which leads me um, to my next question. Um, so, Professor Lowe, you had noted um, there's a particularly uh, like powerful moment in the or segment in the documentary where I believe it was a Comanche, a female veteran, was um, describing her conversations with non-Americans about their perceptions of Native Americans um, or their own perceptions of, of what what a Native American is or isn't. Um, so, what what made that moment um, so powerful for you? You know, Larry, and Larry, I've, I've watched this film now probably a half dozen times or more, and we get to that point and it always makes me cry. There's something um, so powerful about having a culture figure from your community who is known throughout the world and, um, and, and stereotyped and um, reduced, you know, to, um, a, a cry that that paratroopers use when they jump out of airplanes 
Um, the history of Geronimo is so rich. It's tragic. It's it's exhilarating. It's um, empowering. And and then to have her talk to these individuals who who thought that the United States had wiped out her entire people. Um, and to be able to tell them that not only did her people not get wiped out, they survived and they're thriving is such a powerful moment for me because it kind of encapsulates um, in this one little story, what's happened on a grander scale to all native people on this continent. You know, that's Rhonda Williams. I, I'm pretty sure Comanche, Kiowa. And she was filmed at a powwow, at a Veterans Day powwow. And it, it's, I was gonna say it was a bit of luck, but that's not right because you make your own luck. Uh, the reason I bring this up is that we only had a year to make this film. So that meant we had one Veterans Day powwow, one opportunity to film it. And I did an intense amount of research trying to figure out which was the right one to film. And it was Stephanie Birdwell in the, in the Department of Veterans Affairs who had hooked me up and I, when I said I had 70 people to talk to, one of them was Lance Asapermi, uh, Comanche, Kiowa. And he said, he basically tried to sell me on, on his powwow. So this is the best one. And it was in Oklahoma where there are, I think the, the most number of tribes, if not the most number of people, I think it's 35 tribes in Oklahoma. And I thought, okay, this sounds like the right place to be. And then he, what he really sold me on, he said, if the weather is bad, we'll be indoors. And I said, okay, good. Then I can count on it happening <laughs> because as a filmmaker, you don't want to have your one opportunity ruined by, by bad weather. And that's where I met Rhonda Williams. I had actually talked to her before, but that story hadn't come out. And she was not feeling well the day before the powwow when we were supposed to do the interviews. So we put her off till after the powwow. And I don't know if you know, it's not only, if you notice, it's not only the story she tells about Geronimo and being in Afghanistan, but she talks about the meaning of that powwow to her. Well, I couldn't have gotten that out of her if I had done it the day before, because I hadn't, wouldn't have seen the powwow. Right. And that brings me to one other point, which I, I think uh, probably most Native Americans understand is that powwows are now pan-Indian. They, you know, they were not a tradition of every tribe and they were very different when they had them and they had different names and different places and did different things. Um, but now there's a bit of a, I wouldn't say homogeneity, but a, a uniformity, certain things happen and certain uh, dressing and dances happen. And the idea of the military being honored at the powwows, that is across the country. So you, you can't make any blanket statements about Native Americans, everybody cautions you about that. But there is an exception, which is that whether there are gatherings, whether they're called powwows or not, people in the military veterans are going to be honored. So we had no trouble finding those images. Uh, the, on the uh, US government sites, we found plenty that uh, we could use and we also were able to acquire, acquire some. And I find that some of the most powerful material in the film. And there's one, there's an older man and younger man who are dancing very energetically. It turns out they're father and son. And uh, we, they, they're credited, their names are in the credits, but we couldn't squeeze that into the film to say, hey, these guys are father and son. But when I see it, I find that very emotional. Mm -hmm. And I should note just for our audience, uh, thank you, Larry. Um, we are coming up on our time right now, um, but if you'd have a few moments, I do have a few more questions for you, if, if you do have sure. a moment. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I'd recorded a few uh, question that, questions that had come through, um, but as you've kind of gone through um, your process in, in developing this documentary, you've answered a lot of the, the questions. Um, but, so here's one for both of you then. So there's, there's obviously like a, a great deal of, of pride in Native American communities within both veteran communities and from an outside perspective, non-veteran tribal perspective anyway. Um, however, I've noticed that there was this duality throughout the, um, the piece um, where you know, you're talking about the boarding school experience, which led to higher enlistment rates. So generally in, a, in today's context, do you see any negatives 
of the concept of the warrior tradition? Uh, or is this a net positive in terms of a concept? Hmm. Hmm. Wow. It is an excellent question. I I could hazard a guess. Patty, do you, you want to think while I talk or you want to go? I'm, I'll, I'll think. <laughs> I'll think. Okay. Um, I think the, the cons the way people feel about the military or the way Native Americans participate in the military can be a mixed bag. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have left out something really important here. It's a mixed bag for women, particularly. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a way for, for women to get a leg up and get a lot of experience they wouldn't get elsewhere. But it's still a very macho masculine world and women have a lot of, well, women of all races and backgrounds have trouble in the military. And you know, this, you're seeing there's a lot of changes to try to solve that. Um, so we touched on, on that in, in the film. One thing we did not get into was abuse. Um, and some of the women in the film told me about some really terrible things that had happened to them in the military. So that I think could be a negative aspect. The obvious one is it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, and people then come back to, if they're coming back to the reservations or the cities, if there aren't the resources for them, and this is another, something that, that we couldn't get into in the film, but the sending ceremonies are one thing, but the welcoming ceremonies, mm -hmm. according to the Indian Health Services I spoke to, in, in the long-term effect on, on their PTSD, it wasn't helpful. It was short-term. Um, so the, you need to have long-term psychological services. So a negative aspect would be if the, if the support is not there in the long run, you need to build on that welcoming ceremony. You can't just have one ceremony. It's not one and done and now everything's gonna be fine. I think, I think also, you know, the United States military recruits from within marginalized communities because they know that um, prospects are, are not, um, poor people don't have as many options as, as people that are better off. So, you know, I think there's that exploitation factor as well. And um, whether it's Native Americans or African Americans or Latinx people, um, that remains a problem. Um, the purification ceremonies are really interesting. And that was something that I had wanted to get into in my documentary as well. Um, and there is, I know that Tom Holm, who wrote a wonderful book, if anybody's looking for a good book to read, um, Strong Hearts, Wounded Spirits, Wounded Souls. Tom Holm, H-O-L-M. He's a Muscogee, Cherokee veteran, and he writes about uh, Vietnam. He's a, a professor emeritus right now. But he looked at long-term benefits, PTSD of, of I think it was mostly men who continued to go through cultural ceremonies um, that addressed PTSD. And I, I think that he had found that, that symptoms were diminished or uh, shortened somehow. So um, I think there's something to, and, and Larry, you're absolutely right. One ceremony you know, is not gonna do it, but if you continue to envelop yourself in culture and take, uh, culture and take, take part in ceremonies, I think that does make a difference, at least what I've read. Thank you so much. And I guess a good way to end things then on the opposite side is a um, question for both of you then. So what is, what is the positive takeaway or positive side then of the warrior tradition and warrior ethos? And where might you see it going in the future? Well, I'll start so you can have the last word, Larry. It's your beautiful documentary. Um, I think, I think the conversations about what constitutes a warrior are going to continue. I think people may broaden out the definition a little bit, but um, it, it, it remains an absolute truth that family and community are very proud of their, of their veterans. Um, veterans bring home this, um, you know, these powerful voices and this understanding of the outside world. 
Um, they've traveled, they've met a lot of people. And so they bring that richness and nuance into their communities. I think that's positive. And I think, you know, it's very, it's very clear that, um, that, that military experience teaches you leadership, it teaches you teamwork, it teaches you some, um, some values that are really useful in, in Native American communities. Yeah, I, I would add to that um, or emphasize that the educational aspect of it, not in the military, but when you come out, the opportunities you're given, um, GI Bill type opportunities is really important. And the other thing um, that you, you can get this from the film, it's not that obvious, but think about it. There's a commonality of experience across Indian country. So when I said you can't you know, ever say that it's all like this, but when you see people sharing that experience, I think that creates a bond. So when I would talk to people about this and they would say, well, I, you know, I've met people and I, I, I they would actually, people would frequently talk to me about how they would immediately find the other Native Americans in their troop. Right. And how gratifying it was to find somebody to talk to. And then that continues after they get out of service. So that that bond, that link, it just makes the Native American community stronger because otherwise it's atomized. It's spread out of, over, you know, more than almost 600 tribes. So thank you both so much for providing all of the, all of the context. Um, to, to this to this documentary, we had a lot of amazing responses in the comments, and, and I think our audience really appreciated um, both the work itself and both of uh, your perspectives as well. Um, I'd like to thank the audience members who have held on with us for their, our last plenary session of the day. Um, once again, thank you all for attending the Warrior Tradition documentary and uh, screening and filmmaker Q&A. Uh, the documentary is available in the conference documents in the enhancement training and veterans training rooms. If you have any questions, contact our team at wellness at tlpi.org. Uh, please note also that the majority of our workshops will be recorded and posted to the virtual environment as well and will remain up until July 30th. After that time, you can find session recordings at enhancementtraining.org. You will also find that there is an evaluation document, which are very valuable to our staff in planning future events. So please do fill that out um, if you do have time to do it. We would really appreciate that. Uh, so once again, uh, miigwech to Patty for joining us today. And thank you so much, Larry. Uh, this was really uh, an, an amazing documentary. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.